So welcome everyone. Uh, the Weasel Head Conservation Area and the Rothney Astrophysical Observatory are located under the starry skies of the traditional territories of the people of the Treaty 7 region in southern Alberta, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy comprising of the Sitaka, Kani and Kainai First Nations, as well as the Tutsina First Nation and the Stony Nakoda, including Chiniki, Bears Paw and Wesley First Nations. The City of Calgary is also home to Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3, of which I am a proud member. So this is a, a shot of the observatory uh, back in the good old days when we had the public visiting us. And so I'm missing those days and hopefully within a few months, uh, we'll be back uh, open and operating, um, not like we did, but certainly uh, welcoming the public uh, just in a, a more um, conservative size of uh, event. If anybody has been to any of our open house nights that we would have upwards of five to 800 people crammed up on top of our hill, um, at the observatory and everybody having a great time looking through the telescopes. And so that won't be the situation in, uh, in certainly in the near future, it'll be more like uh, maybe 40 to 80 people and uh, a lot tinier type of events, but we're certainly uh, making plans because we are looking forward to seeing everyone again. So that's hopefully something that'll be coming uh, along very, very soon. So just uh, as uh, Maureen had mentioned, if you do have any questions for me, please put them in the chat and I will do my very best to answer them at the end of the talk. Um, and I'm very, very pleased to be talking to you tonight about uh, dark skies. Dark skies are something that's uh, near and dear to my heart and everyone at the observatory. But I think that this would be such a wonderful opportunity if the Weaselhead region was also a dark sky preserve in addition to the Anne and Sandy Cross Conservation Area. So think about that as a dark sky region on the western part of Calgary, which would be really quite wonderful if we could create that. And of course, there's often um, when you work together as a team, then you, have, you tend to be a lot more successful than feeling like you're alone in the dark, excuse the pun. And so I've been working with the observatory uh, for the past, like I said, over 15 years. And this, unfortunately, is this is what's coming. So pretty soon we're going to see uh, the observatory covered in snow again. I was just there today and the wind was blowing. And actually, to be honest with you, I miss all of that, uh, the windy weather and the cold. And it's, it's great when I get to go back. We have been doing a lot of uh, technical work on our telescopes and uh, it's been a really tremendous opportunity for us to uh, work on a lot of our equipment and to do a lot of observing. So um, it's, it's been a busy place, despite the fact that we haven't been able to welcome the public. So we are working with um, our surrounding Indigenous communities, and uh, we're hoping to learn a little bit more about them. We're hoping that they are interested in learning more about us and uh, how we can work together uh, going forward on different uh, education initiatives. And uh, more specifically, uh, traditional ways of knowing, uh, scientific expression, and intergenerational teaching. So I wanted to show you uh, what the sky looks like above the observatory. So this is something that we've got uh, and it's on the rooftop of our observatory building. And uh, what you're seeing is the sky above. And so you're seeing stars, planets, you're seeing a very bright moon. And uh, this is the sky that uh, we can see overhead of the observatory. But I just wanna point out something. Uh, this is actually where, if you can see where I'm pointing right here, this is actually when we're looking to the Northeast, uh, we can see the city of Calgary, of course. So we are located 20 minutes Southwest of Calgary on Highway 22 South. And this is unfortunately the, the lit up sky that we see uh, happening to the Northeast of us. Uh, Cal Calgary is, uh, has a very embarrassing um, thing about it, uh, that the fact that it's one of the brightest spots in Western Canada. As a matter of fact, even the Western US, uh, Calgary is particularly bright. And that's a terrible shame. It's not something that we uh, should be happy about. So this is a shot of a lovely 
starry sky and then you can see that light pollution off in the distance. And so uh, I wanted to give you this orientation of what we can actually see at night, but also the fact that there is so much light pollution in the sky. So this is an image that was taken by astrophotographer Larry McNish. And uh, it just gives you an idea of uh, the effects that we have uh, from light pollution from our location. And this really affects uh, what the telescopes can see. The telescopes are collecting light. That's exactly what their whole function is, is that, um, a star generates light, that light travels across space, the telescope collects that light, and then we study the light very closely, and that's how come we can tell you all about that particular star. So if we have a whole bunch of ambient light around the observatory, then it makes it harder and harder for the telescopes to be able to de detect that distant light. So telescopes only work when there's dark skies. So light pollution is unwanted or artificial or this ambient light. And it has a, a negative effect, not only on astronomers, but on us as human beings, birds, animals, insects, plant life. It's, um, it's, it disrupts the natural balance and natural circadian rhythms. We operate very well with dark and light. And that normal uh, balance between dark and light is something that we expect. That's where, well, how we've evolved to expect um, that normal flow. And when that's interrupted by bright lights at night, um, it's, it has a long-term detrimental effect, certainly on humans and also on everything else, um, plants, insects, birds, animals. Dr. Langell, Phil Langell is the director of the observatory and he's been gathering data on um, sky brightness. It's actually a very difficult thing to do. So he has, over the past six years, he's got some special gizmos attached to one of our telescopes and it's actually being able to read the brightness uh, on the sky and, uh, and it's called a sky quality meter. And it's been actually quite a difficult thing to do. There's atmospheric conditions that have to be considered, the phase of the moon. And um, those are just some of the variables that you have to be able to consider when uh, comparing one dark sky night to another. But we are really trying to do our best to understand the impact of urban development on our night sky and what those long-term impacts might be. So this is something that you probably will all recognize that this is the Okotoks rock. And uh, this image was taken at, uh, are you ready for this? At 1.30 a.m. So of course, cameras can pick up more light than your eyes can. And so this camera has picked up light to just show you how much light was coming from the north. So this is a picture that we're standing and uh, facing towards Okotoks and Calgary. And that tells you how much light is in the sky at 1.30 a.m. It's quite a, uh, I can almost call it an obnoxious waste of energy because all of that light is just wasted. It's just going up in the sky. It's not pointed down where you need it. Now, we recognize that we live in a 24-hour society and people need to be able to come and go and move from place to place and need to be able to move around. And that's terrific. And so smart lighting points the light down where you need it. It doesn't point it up where it's just wasted and obviously having an impact on the natural world around us. This is another image looking towards Calgary. This is several uh, kilometers away from Calgary, but also at about 2 a.m. in the morning. And look at how much light that's put in the sky. And just to give you an idea, um, like, the, like I said, the camera can pick up on so much light, but look at all of the stars. That tells you the time of night it was, but all of that light is also reflecting off of this low hanging cloud, making it even brighter in the night. And so once again, you see all of this unfortunate uh, wasted light. So teaching the motion of stars and planets, uh, then the moon and the night sky is certainly lost when uh, you can't point them out to a gen younger generation. Um, I had a group of kids come from an inner city school in Calgary and they came out for an evening program. And these kids were blown away because they had never seen the Milky Way before. And I think that's very, very sad that kids could grow up and be 11 years old and it's the first time they've seen the Milky Way because they live in an area that's so bright at night. So I thought I would show you a picture of what it should look like. So this is Southern Alberta in the Milk River region. And this image, it was taken uh, by 
um, Alan Dyer, astrophotographer Alan Dyer, and this is credible. Now, so once again, uh, I'm showing this image is very detailed. This is a little bit more than you'd be able to see with your eyes, of course, because you're actually seeing the green here is the aurora. And then what you're seeing rising off, off of the horizon is the Milky Way, an arm of our galaxy. So up to 100 years ago, the Foothill region offered this type of clear window to the universe and dark skies allowed us to see the stars of our stellar neighborhood. Humans, animals, plants, all forms of light survived and thrived in and found comfort in the regular patterns of light of day and dark of night. And this is a really a, a big concern for us at the observatory. So we spend a lot of our time talking about this issue and um, around uh, advocacy for light pollution mitigation. And so I always like to think about what we're missing and maybe even think about 100 years ago what the sky would have looked like. So it's, it's such an interesting thing because uh, there were dark skies everywhere about 100 years ago. And the idea of lighting up urban areas in such a massive way is really a, a new phenomenon. Uh, people survived quite well for thousands of years without all of that night light. But for now, for some reason, they think that we can't make a, even a small little uh, uh, journey from A to B without it all being very well lit up. So it's a typical human. It's always, always too much. Everything's always too much. So knowledge related to astronomy and celestial motion is not only cerebral, but it's innate. Indigenous ways of knowing are based upon this type of land and sky context. And how do you educate a generation about these connections when you can't show the, the younger generation the stars? Elder transfer of knowledge is hampered by light pollution and the loss of dark skies. Younger generations need these dark skies to explore how knowledge of land and sky was employed in practical applications of wayfinding and celestial navigation. So something that the university is very involved with, University of Calgary is involved in um, reconciliation and uh, we work very hard uh, to find ways to uh, work together with uh, surrounding communities, uh, encourage uh, Indigenous students to be a part of the work that we're doing in science and doing at, at the observatory. And it's very, very important for us. Finding our place in the university. So this is actually the teepee that was up at the Ann and Sandy Cross Conservation Area. And I, I, I think it's a point in methods because once again, I'm looking towards the Northeast when I took this image and then you can see all of that sky glow uh, from Calgary, but then you're also seeing all of that sky glow then reflecting on the clouds, making it even brighter. So at the RAO, we are really concerned about these issues around stewardship of the night sky and also uh, the challenges of opening sciences up to diverse world perspectives. And so the RAO projects that I've been working on have allowed me to gain insight and uh, a deepening respect for indigenous scientific knowledge. And uh, this is one of my objectives is to find ways to blend Western science or colonial science, depends on how you wanna uh, word it, with the night sky with intergenerational learning approaches. Astronomy is a great opportunity um, to work with Indigenous science because of the regular patterns of more so than any of the other natural sciences. The sun rises in the east and sets in the west, and that happens every day. There's the usual patterns, and then throughout the year, you can find the sun in different places in the sky, and it's you can always count on those regular patterns happening. And so there is uh, thousands of uh, years of human tradition around following those patterns and understanding uh, celestial motion from a particular point on earth. So uh, protecting these dark skies and understanding how uh, indigenous peoples have understood that celestial motion has been a really uh, important project that I've been working on. Thousands of years of observing the night sky and sharing knowledge has developed into complex spiritual, philosophical, and scientific traditions, 
all things are related within the context of the convergence of land and sky and all living things. I've been listening and understanding the preservation and transfer of knowledge as it relates to astronomy. And this knowledge takes the form of architecture, stories, art, song, dance, and ceremonies. Canadian and Indigenous peoples have looked to the sky for guidance in practical endeavors, but also spiritual identity. They look at the sky as a map, a clock, and a calendar for thousands of years. The movement of celestial objects across the sky has been observed, and the stars are used as a compass for orientation and direction. According to Beverly Hungry Wolf in her text, The Ways of My Grandmothers, this is the wonderfully complex survival knowledge that demonstrates an innate connection between the land and the sky. Indigenous peoples have survived and traveled and created extensive trade networks. And this was all done with superior knowledge of wayfinding and navigation. And navigation is planning a route toward a destination and what tools, symbols, and methods are used to steer you along your path. Wayfinding is the orientation of finding oneself with, in terms of where you are within a land and sky scape. So what you're seeing here, the image that I'm showing you is uh, these are uh, Nakota riders. And this was an image that was taken back in the 1930s. And so when I'm talking about these trade work networks, um, there was, there's so much archeological evidence of travel and movement over several thousand miles that were normal trade routes um, that were taken for uh, hundreds and hundreds of years, people have followed these paths. And the only way that you can do that is with superior nav navigational techniques. We, uh, the one um, area where many people understand a little bit more is when you think about navigating it at sea. And so you can think of say, perhaps um, indigenous Polynesian ways of navigating and it's a very very difficult thing there were certain families that were tasked with keeping this knowledge and transferring that knowledge but if you can imagine open water uh, celestial navigation in the ocean uh, was a difficult thing and that's why that show um, the disney show moana is so terrific because they show her using these techniques when she's trying to sail east towards hawaii so there was also land-based techniques where there was a connection between finding um, different points, different landforms, different markers that meant something, and then being able to link those points with the position of objects in, in the sky, whether that's Jupiter and, or maybe it was the moon, but there would be certain ways that navigation was used uh, to be able to uh, travel these extensive trade networks. This is a story robe that was actually gifted to the University of Calgary. And what this particular story robe is telling the year of indigenous strategy initiatives at the University of Calgary. And so story robes are an amazing um, record. They were created by um, an elder traditionally. And this elder would serve as the uh, the community historian, but they would also um, act as the community astronomer because the story robe was actually, even by its uh, selection of time, is astronomical because it went from solstice to solstice. So it completed a solar year, and those were all of the events within that year were recorded on the story blanket. So one particular one is very interesting, thanks to your own still. He's uh, one of the professors at the uh, physics department. And he told me about a, a really interesting example of a uh, rope that uh, had an incident on it. And what this incident was called was stars fall down. And it was in reference to an unusual astronomical event that happened in 1834. So this winter count, starry robe, uh, depicts an event um, and it was, may have been related to a very intense meteor shower that happened that year. According to Mary Egermont Molnar and Lavina Many Guns, who did the uh, work and the scholarship on this particular story rope, this uh, Blackfoot winter count of 1834 contained a story of an incident where a 
medicine man called Bull got lift was attacked and killed. And he was a very important person in the, in the community. And they were, it was a very sad event when he was killed. At the moment he was killed, the moon was no longer seen in the sky. And all the stars looked like they were falling down and jumping towards each other. And it stayed that way for nearly two days. So imagine this wonderfully dark sky due to the new moon phase and a very active meteor shower. And what's the reason why I'm telling you about this is, is an interesting example about how there's another layer of historical record of connecting land and sky, uh, time and space, and how um, Blackfoot peoples had culturally uh, had, there's much evidence that we can find of those sorts of connections. And uh, through this, uh, this astronomical knowledge and, and threads of information, we can see how significant the sky was to Indigenous lifeways. So we have been working on a project. Uh, this is actually an image that was created uh, by a young artist. He's wonderful from University of Lethbridge and his name is Bryce Singer. And this is Old Man Nappy. And so this is a, a, a drawing that he's created. And so we've got this now uh, really big size on our uh, walls at the observatory and in our interpretive center. And you can see that um, it's blending night and day and um, Nappy controlling and uh, working with that natural balance, that ebb and flow of night and day. And so it's, it's a wonderful um, symbol and many, many symbols together of uh, the work that we are trying to do at the observatory. So I've been very fortunate, uh, met and worked with many elders and one of them was Louis Soup. And Louis Soup was an elder with the Kainai Nation. And um, he shared with me the story of the Morning Star. And it's a story of uh, sisters that were out picking berries. And these berries, really wonderful sisters were tasting the berries and having a wonderful time and talking together and laughing. And they look up in the sky and there's this bright, beautiful star. So one of the sisters says to the other, see that star? I'm going to marry that star. It's so beautiful. And the other sister said, you're crazy. I don't know what you're talking about. So they had a laugh over that. And then as they were walking back towards their home, the star actually came down and said to the sister who wanted to marry him, said, I want to marry you too. I want you to come with me and we'll come up together to the sky. And so she went. She went up him, with him to the sky and together they were married and lived very happily. But he said to her, he warned her, see that turnip over there? I'm going to ask this one thing of you. Don't pull up that turnip, just leave it be. So time went on and they were very happy together as husband and wife, but curiosity got the better of her. And one day when Morning Star was not there, she snuck out and she pulled up and she pulled and pulled up that turnip and she looked down because it had left a hole in the cloud. And she looked down and she could see all of her family and everyone living together that she'd been missing all this time. And she realized just how much she missed them. And she thought about it and decided, no, I wanna go back down to the earth and to be with my people again. So she explained to Morning Star, I think you're a wonderful husband, but I feel like it's time for me to go back with my people again. So he agreed. And he was very sad to see her go. And so what he gave her was gifts. And one of the gifts was a white elk's tooth dress. And he also gave her the gift of the Sundance. And when she returned to the earth, that's what she brought back to her people. And this was a story that was told to me by Louis Soup. And uh, the morning star is actually the planet Venus. And some of you who might have noticed that bright, beautiful Venus has been in the sky at night now, just after the sun sets in the west. If you see a bright, bright object, you're actually looking at uh, lovely Venus in the sky. So the traditional uh, story, his Louis Soup's style of telling the story reveals a method of teaching through metaphor that explores astronomical and cosmological concepts. It requires the listener to comprehend the interrelationships 
um, and show and think about how everything is related. It's talking about the phase of Venus, when we can see Venus in the sky, the symbols of Venus, and um, also talking about the cultural origins of elder women and their responsibility and respect in the community, talked about the Sundance. It's very, very important knowledge is transferred, but it requires the listener to think about what they're hearing when they hear the story and to look for that important information. Uh, building on uh, this instructional metaphorical intent of Indigenous teaching traditions, we see a teepee is also an iconic symbol making those types of connections. So Louis Soup is someone that I've worked with and then also who I've worked with, this is Sierra. Sierra was a student that we worked with um, and we've been very fortunate. We got some funding so that we were able to hire an Indigenous student over the past summer. And she's been, she was really great to work with and she helped me um, and we've now got a, uh, a display and it's just was installed on Friday, as a matter of fact. So we've got display panels up at the Interpretive Center. And uh, we're also were able to work with uh, this gentleman here. And this is Dwayne Mistaken Chief. And Dwayne has been wonderful guidance for us. We're very thankful for his uh, efforts and his work with us. And we were able to learn a great deal from him. He's actually a, uh, a wellness coordinator with Alberta Health, and he works at the Sheldon Schumer um, Health Center Healing Lodge. He's a Blackfoot uh, elder, and he was uh, born on the Kainai Nation. And uh, he's actually, he's got a, a published book, uh, Blackfoot Ways of Knowing. And uh, what's included in Duane's teachings is that the plants root soil, the moon, the morning sun, the water, animals, song, and ceremony, it's all Sam, which is, it's all medicine. So we need everything to be well and in balance around us. And so Dwayne gifted us with a teepee design, and that is part of our exhibit. So we're very, very fortunate to be able to have worked with Dwayne and with Sierra. So the teepee is, is quite symbolic of this land sky connection that we've been working with. Um, it symbolizes the renewal of cosmic mo movements, seasonal transformations, and the migrations of humans um, are all contained in teepee design. And so just gonna show you a few of the symbols. Here's some of our symbols that we have on our TP design. And so what you can actually see here is that these are symboling, uh, symbolizing asterisms. So what you have at the top of the TP is the smoke flaps. And so what you're seeing here is the North Star. So this is the part that for, uh, points north. And then you, what you're seeing here is actually the um, six lost boys. And so you see that asterism, which is actually Pallades, so that's to the south. And then um, what you're seeing here is the, uh, that's also the, the uh, Ursa Major. And so that's another wonderful story. And so those smoke flaps are actually very symbolic of the sky. And then uh, what you're seeing here is actually, this is um, the prairie puffballs, and that's what's along the bottom of the TP, and that's the connection to the earth. And so many stories, sorry, oh, sorry, got ahead of myself there. Many stories are told in between. Many stories uh, are very symbolic about who is gifting the TP design, who's receiving the TP design. And those are the stories that would be on the major body of the TP, but that land and sky connection is definitely uh, part of um, all of the designs of Blackfoot TPs. They're part of, um, these narratives really had pragmatic uh, purposes as well. And uh, they were also uh, very uh, much um, symbolic, but symbolic of the importance of the people who lived within the teepee. So what's also very important is teepee position and how it's placed and how it's erected. Um, and this continues this with this metaphor connections between land and sky. So TPs are placed astronomically, they're paced east to greet the morning sun. 
and that allows you to pray towards the morning sun um, as it rises. And that shift of where the teepee is placed is astronomical because as you know, we live in Alberta, so there is quite a big shift of where the sun rises, whether it's due east or whether it's northeast. In the summer, it's northeast. In the winter, it's east, but the opening of the teepee follows where the sun rises in the east. So that in that way, it's, it's also astronomical. So this, uh, the teepee is an embodiment of the land and sky connection. And that has to do also with lodgepole placement and that the lodgepole is astronomical. It's a sacred object and it's a tangible record of the multi-layered, multi-generational stories. And it comes very meaningful uh, once you tell the story related to it. So rock cairns are an, an interesting one. Uh, there's, they're very large sites. Um, they're thousands of years old. They're a wonderful testament to all of the, um, the movement and gatherings that had happened over thousands of years on the Northwestern Plains of North America. And there's some of them are, uh, they've dated to as old as 3000 years. And um, they tend to be also in colder climates. The diameter uh, can be as large as 60 yards. And then at the center the cairn or the, the centerpiece can be as high as, high as uh, three or four feet up. And the bighorn medicine wheel that's in Wyoming is dated to 3000 years old. And that's the one that's near Sheridan. They're quite amazing. They are uh, a spoke design. Uh, so they're out in Stever so they're often the often 38 spokes. And the tough thing is, though, is trying to attribute whether or not they were astronomical. So there is no doubt many elders talk about that they are sacred sites. They're tools of wayfinding along um, uh, a trail. And there are also lots of indications that they're, they were gathering places. The tougher thing is to trying to figure out whether or not uh, they're astronomical and whether or not there's a definitive tangible link between um, a marker of what's happening in the sky in relation to the, this position of the rocks on the ground. Archaeologists um, can only tell you the evidence that they have, and uh, but and what they'll tell you is that it's very difficult to know that uh, the reason why somebody moved a rock over land and positioned it in a certain way, and to understand what their intent was a thousand years ago. Um, another thing that's very important is that not only do you have to have the rock cairn, you also have to have a distant marker. So there has to be a distant point on a hill, for example. So where you're standing, then what you would watch is that celestial object, say like the moon or the sun go over top of that distant point in relation to where you're standing on earth. So it's, it's a complicated thing. And there isn't always that secondary point near these rock cairns. So I would say that um, I've, I listen to what uh, I've learned from the elders that I've spoken to, and they talk about it as, uh, like I said, as a place of wayfinding and as a gathering place, sacred site. And so, but the astronomical part is, is a little bit tougher to find the evidence for. Uh, it doesn't mean that it wasn't used for astronomical reasons. It's just that the evidence, uh, we, we find it difficult to find that. And so, but I'm, I'm very happy that today, uh, many communities, uh, Indigenous peoples continue to find them to be sacred sites, and uh, they still are places of gathering and of uh, uh, spiritual centers. So that's very important, uh, I think. So this is, um, be, there's a whole bunch of activity happening. I'll just get and stop that for a second so I can explain what's happening. So that once again, we're back at the observatory um, all sky camera, and uh, we've had a lot of uh, aurora borealis activity. So the aurora is created when there's a, a burst of charged particles come off the sun, they travel across the solar system, and because of our magnetic field, they whip around the earth. As these charged particles whip around the earth, they actually churn up our uh, atmosphere. 
And that's where we get all of this activity of the northern lights. And then when you see the colors of the northern lights, what you're seeing is the gases in our atmosphere. So this was on, um, this was a, a very busy uh, weekend that we had. So this particular night I'm showing you is, even though it was cloudy, um, this is what we saw on November the 4th. So you can see there's a lot of, uh, so this is obviously a time lapse of what happened over the evening. And we can see the clouds are gonna slowly move off. And uh, you can see, so we'll start to see some of the developing auroral activity. So Cree peoples talk about the aurora, and that's very common that there's lots of mythology in indigenous um, peoples who live around the Arctic Circle. So Cree people, so I'll just show you that again. So Cree people talk about a whistling, and they say that if you hear a whistle um, that from the aurora, that's a, a bad thing because it means that uh, they might come down, the sky people from the Aurora will come down and they'll grab you. So that's a fun thing that people would tell kids. So they'd say, don't whistle around the Aurora. If you see the Aurora, don't whistle because then you'll bring attention to yourself and the sky people will come down and grab you and take you back up to the sky with them. And so it does have a pragmatic uh, purpose to telling kids those kinds of stories because it tells them when you're outside, don't draw attention to yourself because there's animals and all sorts of predators that might want to get you. So there you can see that amazing auroral activity right there. Isn't that incredible? In um, when we're talking about indigenous um, Arctic circle cultures um, in Norway, they talk about uh, Valhalla. And they say that when they see this kind of activity in the sky, that that's actually the, the warriors who are up in Valhalla and that we're seeing the light glinting off of their shields. So there's a lot of wonderful mythologies around the Aurora because it is very mysterious and, and pretty wonderful to see. So we, um, just like the uh, initiatives that um, the weasel head is talking about, one of the things that we like to do is talk to people uh, provide educational opportunities for them to learn about the importance of dark skies and hopefully have that appreciation, that wonder of looking up at the night sky and um, having that connection, that, uh, that connection to nature, which is really so important. Uh, we do offer school programs, of course, and hopefully uh, we'll be able to have kids back at the observatory very, very soon. This is a grade six class from uh, Tsutsina, and they're learning how to put together telescopes and go out and have a look. And um, this, these kids look like they're having fun. I normally don't allow fun at the, my during my programs. I'm kidding. But um, this, this is a, a fun activity that we do, but we make sure we do it during the day so that they can appreciate um, the optics that they're uh, that they are needed to be able to see things at a great distance to be able to collect light. So, another uh, initiative so that wherever we get a chance to talk to people about uh, dark skies, we try and take those opportunities. This is um, actually a painting that was done on a window, and this was done by an artist, and her name is Sarah Osmani. And she really captured this idea that out by the observatory, away from city lights, you can see amazing things, but you can see as you get closer into the city, um, you lose that ability to see the night sky. And so I think she captured it uh, wonderfully. So we are the uh, uh, representative for the International Dark Sky Association, uh, but we also work very closely with the Royal Astronomical Society, and that's who the weasel head is uh, working with. Um, on working towards their dark sky uh, preserve status. So there's lots of uh, great resources up there about some things that you can do. Uh, light pollution mitigation is actually amazingly a simple thing to do. And yet it's, uh, it, of course, it's just a mindset. So um, you can go outside and just think about your own lights. Are you leaving uh, backyard lights on for some reason? Um, all you're really doing is telling the bad guys where the door is. It doesn't uh, prevent any crime. And there's been so many studies about that. Uh, you can talk to people in your community about um, maybe that there's opportunities where maybe um, you can get together and maybe approach, say, perhaps an industrial site or a commercial 
um, organization that they may be putting up too much uh, light in an area. You can talk to the government about uh, new developments like the um, Alpine residential community that's going out in Western, just uh, west of Stony. And um, that's the sort of thing that, you know, really makes a big difference on being able to maybe stop or curb some of the lighting that uh, is waste, all that lighting waste. It does have a lot of negative impacts and you can see, so I just want to point out that this is actually a, um, information that's come from Dark Skies London, as in London, Great Britain. So it's an international thing. There's lots of people thinking about this and realizing that it's a waste and it can be uh, very harmful to have too much light in the sky, especially blue spectrum light, which is uh, even more harmful. It's unnatural for us to be seeing blue spectrum light during the day. I'm sorry, it's a natural thing to see it uh, during the day from the sun, but it's unnatural to have blue spectrum light at night. So this is the positive thing, is that in addition to many other international places uh, like Great Britain, Europe, uh, very interested in reducing light pollution, they've also come up with some very cool ideas. And this is actually a phosphorus path that uh, they're experimenting with in the Netherlands. And I think that's a very cool idea and look at all of the lovely darkness around, but the person walking or riding a bike on that path can easily see their way. And so I like to think that there's a lot of very positive things that uh, people are working at and coming up with some really great ideas about how we might be able to mitigate some of the light pollution that we're experiencing. Okay. So I just want to encourage you, turn off your lights if possible, but also get out and do some of your own observing. Um, the sundown now is already at, ugh, it's already at, uh, today it was at 4.58 p.m. with sundown. Yeah, that's so early. But the nice thing is, is that we get to be in darkness earlier. And so there, right now the moon phase is a waxing crescent. And so there's just a sliver of a moon out there. So if you went out, uh, say, even as early as um, 6.30, tomorrow night, if it's clear, you'll be able to see Venus setting in the, on the western horizon, bright Venus. But if you look due south, then you'll be able to see Saturn and Jupiter in the sky. How you know you're looking at a planet is that it looks like a flat disk of light as opposed to a twinkly star. But we've had some beautiful nights and actually um, it looks like we've got some more beautiful nights ahead in the forecast for the next few days. So hopefully you can get out and uh, check out the dark sky for yourself.